All right. I want to welcome everyone uh, via Facebook. We appreciate you tuning in today. Wherever you might be across the country, we so much appreciate it. We hope you have a little better look today, a little better sound for you, as we've been trying to improve this for quite some time. And uh, so we're looking forward to uh, this is our first uh, service uh, with the new things that we have put in place. So hope it'll be good for you, but I want you to join right in and worship with us. And before the message this morning, Sister Amelia is going to come and sing for us. This is the piano is sing together. So. Take me on to heaven, and then we'll, we'll get it right. All right, appreciate that song. Uh, we had a, our destination unknown yesterday for, the, uh, for our youth, and we went, uh, we went bowling, went to Chippewa for bowling, and uh, man, man, it was all I could do to stay up with Odin and Tin, and especially Ozo. Man, he was tearing it up. They were tearing it up on the lanes yesterday. And I uh, couldn't, uh, couldn't hardly stay up with them. They did a great job. Had a lot of fun. Appreciate all the uh, helps uh, that came out to be with us uh, yesterday as well. All right, at this time, we'll dismiss our Good News Explorers. You'll be following Sister Linda today and Sister Carol. With our... Uh, New camera in place. Uh, they, they got me set up where uh, I can move all over. <laughs> they don't have to follow me around. I'm all over. The, they got me all set up where I can go all over the place. So I've got freedom to just preach and run. Preach and run. So if you want to run with me, it's okay. We'll, we can do that too. All right. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Luke. The book of Luke chapter 15. You know, uh, when you read the scriptures and you read through the Bible, uh, 
Uh, do you ever just sort of get led back to some familiar stories? Do you feel like you want to go back and reread something or you want to go back and look at something again? And it's been a while since you've been there. And, but listen, the prodigal son is one of my favorites. Luke 15, uh, the book of Luke is probably my favorite book in the Bible. Uh, and, and it has so many great things in this chapter alone. But, uh, but the prodigal son is such, you know, it's kind of like, you know, we just had a, some great services in revival with Chip, and he came and preached on Jonah. And, you know, I told you uh, a couple times during that week that I found myself more like Jonah than I wanted to admit, you know. And I find myself, too, uh, at times in my life, and maybe you as well, I find myself relating more to the prodigal son than I want to admit. And so I want us to look at some things in this, uh, in this story uh, that maybe we haven't uh, uh, hit on uh, before. So let's start reading at verse 11, and we're just going to read through 16 to start with, and we'll eventually get through verse 20. But verse 11, and he said, this is Jesus speaking, a certain man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me, and he divided unto them his living. Let me just stop right there, and because I, something that just came to my mind, so the Lord must want me to, to, to mention it. It's not part of the message, but there were two boys. And one thing you're going to find out is that these two sons, both of them were more alike than they want to admit. One of them stayed home with the father doing the work that he was supposed to do, but he did not appreciate what he had any more than the prodigal did who took his uh, inheritance and went out and wasted it on riotous living because when he came back the other brother remember he was working in the field and he came in and they was having a party he wasn't happy that his brother was alive he wasn't happy that his brother was home he was just upset because they were having a party i've never had a party you could have had a party his father said everything i got here is yours he didn't appreciate it any more than the prodigal son there were two sons here involved but today we'll look at the prodigal I like that. Verse 12, uh, verse 13. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country. And there wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land, and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would fain have filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. We'll stop right there. This morning I'm going to preach on the subject, where could I go but to the Lord? Let's pray. Father, we're just so thankful, again, for this opportunity that we get a couple times a week to gather in this place with your people around your word, led by the Spirit of God in the presence of God, to worship. And I thank you for that, Lord. Let us not take it for granted. But Lord, I pray you would bless us and speak to us through this story and through your word. And Lord, we'll give you the praise for what's accomplished in this place today. In Jesus' name, amen. The prodigal son knew what he wanted. His desires led him to gamble on things that God had condemned. You know, things always look a little greener on the other side of the fence. And, and we, we think it's all brighter, and we think, listen, because we don't understand how the enemy truly works on us. The enemy makes it look nice. The enemy makes it look pretty. The enemy makes it look shiny, makes us want to go and grab a hold of things. But listen, our guidance is not the world and not the enemy. Our guidance is the Lord and the Holy Spirit. Should I go with this? Should I take a hold of that? Should I be involved in that? Those are the questions I need to be asking as a child of God. I don't just run out and grab a hold of everything that's shiny and new and looks good and sounds good and could be good, but it could not be good. Listen, I've used this illustration many times, but listen, when you're out fishing 
and I like to fish, and I like to fish for bass and crappie and bluegill, and I like to do it on a spinner. It's, it's actually a rooster tail, and you take it and you throw it out there, and then you slowly draw it back, and the rooster tail has a spinner on it, and it's shiny, and it spins in the water, and the fish t- uh, get, a, get a look at that, and they, they, they believe that's dinner. But on the other side of that spinner is three hooks waiting to, tra- t- to latch onto him. And so when he latches on that, you set the hook and then you reel him in for dinner. Listen, that is exactly what the world tries to do. It tries to throw out the rooster tail and get you looking and pull you away from God and away from church and away from the Bible and away from prayer and away from God's people. And then when you think it's all good and you latch on, then he sets it and then he hooks you and then he tries to draw you in the prodigal son thought he knew exactly what he wanted I just want to get out of the father's house I just want to leave where I'm at I just can't be myself here I just can't be my own man I can't be my own person listen sound familiar I can't do what I want to do I can't be have the freedom that I want until I break out from my parents home until I get away from the father Listen, it was all things that he thought was going to be better and good. Not necessarily wrong that he asked for his inheritance early, although it was unusual. You didn't get the inheritance until the father died, and then it was split among the boys. But he wanted his early because he wanted to go and see what this world had to offer. It promised a satisfaction. It promised uh, to fulfill his appetites and his ambitions and his desires, and it lured him by its promises, promises of fulfillment, promises of purpose, promises of happiness. Listen, you watch commercials on TV. Aren't they all promising those things? Don't they all tell you that this is where it's at? And listen, drink this beer or get involved in this group or do these things, and these things will bring you happiness and fulfillment and you'll be a success in life and you'll enjoy life and anything less than this, you're less than a person. Listen, it's not true, but that's what we hear all the time. And so because of our fleshly desires, and let me tell you something, please don't underestimate your flesh. It is a powerful tool. It is a powerful thing. And if you don't think it is, just... Have a day that things don't go so well. Have a day when it's not all smiles and it's not all coming up roses. Have a day when you don't feel so good. Have a day when everybody's pushing your buttons and and you're on your last nerve. Have one of those days and then you'll find out you might start thinking things, you might start saying things, you might start doing things that you wouldn't normally do because the flesh wants to let those things go. We want them under the control of the Spirit of God. The fruit of the Spirit, self control. Listen, are you under that influence? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, temperance, self-control. Not fruits, not plural, not plural though. There's many aspects of it. One fruit. Do you have the fruit of the Spirit that has all of these things? That's how we're to be led. That's how we're to live. Do we and are we? Or do we find ourselves a little more like the prodigal than we want to admit about what's on the other side of the fence? He was certain that he would be better off on his own. You know, I thought that too when I moved out from my home. I moved from home when I was 17. I had just graduated high school. And uh, I moved out from home, and I, I was convinced that I would be better off if I was on my own. And I was convinced of it until the next meal come around, and Mom didn't have it fixed. It was me eating a bologna sandwich, right? Until the clothes needed washing. And there was nobody to wash my clothes and, and have them folded and set on my bed where I could just put them away or put them on. Uh, when the... When, when the rent was due, and when the electric bill was due, and when the insurance was due, 
And when there was no one there to wake me up in the morning to get me to work, when there was no one there to meet me when I come home in the evening, then all of a sudden it wasn't quite what I anticipated before I moved out. Because, listen, folks, the world looks like it's so wonderful and you just can't wait to grab a hold of it. But I'm going to tell you something. Reality will set in. And if you're not careful, it'll set in and take you in a way that you're not prepared to go. Somehow, he just believed that when he got into the world that these things would make him free. If I'm on my own, if I, I'm my own man, there's nobody to tell me what to do. But you're not your own man. You are still a slave to the desires of your flesh if you allow your flesh to take over. In your thought life, in what you do, in what, you, what your actions are, and what you long for, Listen, when my appetites and my fleshly desires are left alone, guess what? I'm out of control. Let me tell you what the flesh is about. Because, listen, folks, I think we underestimate ourselves. I think somehow we think that when we come to know Christ and we get saved, that that battle of the flesh is over. Folks, that battle's just beginning. It's just starting. You're going to fight against what God wants you to do, against what you want to do. And I'm afraid we're winning the battle. We're doing more of what we want to do and not as much as what God wants us to do. Let me tell you something about the flesh. The flesh is about the here and now. The flesh is about if it feels good, do it. We all know that slogan that went around. I'm not hurting anyone. Well, let me just take it even a step farther. I don't care if I'm hurting anyone or not. What about me? Someone just told me this week <laughs> that they have a 21-year-old son who says to them, I can't work more than 20 hours a week. I got to have a life. I got to have a life. I can't work more than 20. How do you expect me to work 40 and 50 hours a week and have a life? I got to have a life. They said, who do you think is going to fund that life? Not me. Not me. Right? Right? Listen, is this not what the world thinks today? Listen, this is how the flesh operates. This is how the flesh thinks. Let me just share something with you. you we have convinced ourselves to work less and expect more. Why? Because I'm entitled to it. The world owes me. The government owes me. My family owes me. Is this not what's being taught today? You don't have to do anything. They owe you. They should give to you. You don't have to work for it. Listen, 2 Thessalonians 4.10 says this. If a man would not work, he shall not eat. Now, that's not talking about somebody disabled. That's not talking about somebody who can't work and somebody has to do things for them. It's not talking about that at all. Let me tell you something. How many people are on the welfare system today that are well able to work? How many people that are drawing disability today that are well able to work? They're in better condition than I am. Because they feel somebody owes them? They're entitled to, listen, if you are in a position where welfare comes to your aid because that's what you have, that's what it's there for, to help those that are in that kind of need, then that's what you do. If you are disabled and you can't work and you don't have anybody to take care of you and the government comes through and says, yes, we've, de we've decided that you are disabled and you can't work and we're going to do what we can, here's what we can do and we're going to give you this, then that's great. 
But listen, you and I both know because we can think of people right now and we can come up with our own examples of where that doesn't work right. To be honest with you, if the church just did its job, we wouldn't need a welfare department. Amen, Brother Joe, you preach it. I'll amen myself. Listen, I'm telling you, we, the church, when it started out, the, the Levitical priests got no inheritance. Their job was to take care of their families and take care of the church and take care of the needy and the homeless and the widows and the fatherless, and they were to take care of those people. The church fumbled the ball somewhere along the line, and we don't hardly take care of anybody. Thank you, Jim. It's not nearly as fun to amen myself. Listen, we want the benefits of the gospel, but don't ask me to live the gospel. The prodigal son wanted, listen, you want to go out and you want to live that kind of life? Then go. What do you need your inheritance for? Just go. This inheritance, you didn't earn it. You didn't deserve it. You're getting it. I'm giving it to you. It's, this is mine. This is what I put together. And I'm going to give it out to my boys when I'm gone. And you want yours early so you can go waste it? You can go out and live for the world and do these things? Listen, you wanted the benefits of the Father, but you didn't want to live for the Father. I want the benefits of the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. Bless me. Bless my family multiply my wealth, give me a good job, give me a good home, give me a, give me a good car to drive, uh, maybe two, give me all of these worldly things, give, 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 but don't ask me to live the gospel. Don't ask me to pray. Don't ask me to read my Bible. Don't ask me to take, uh, uh, take a part in the church. Don't ask me to witness to somebody. I got my own life to live. How can I do something for God and then live for me? Mm. See, we're not as far away from the prodigal son as we think we are. Let me give you some examples. Genesis chapter 3, verse 6, listen to this. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes... And a tree to be desired to make one wise. She took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also to her husband with her and he did eat. Forget about what God said. I want it. How many decisions do you make in your life just like that? The Lord might direct you in a different direction. The Lord might put up the stop sign and say, no, this is not the way to go. No, you shouldn't have this. No, this won't be good for you. And you say, forget about what God says. I'm going to do it anyway. Forget the fact that look at all of these trees in the garden that I can eat of. Look at all the things that God has blessed me with. He shows up in the evening, in the cool of the day, and we talk with each other, we walk with each other, we commune with each other. Man, it's glorious, it's wonderful, it's beautiful. My wife and I, we, we share with the Lord, and, and he share all of this with us. With the animals come up to us, and oh, what a wonderful, wonderful place to live. Oh, wait a minute. That one tree over there that God says, don't eat of that fruit. Got to have it. Got to have it. Prodigal son had all he needed and wanted at home. But no, nope, what's out there that is forbidden and what looks, you know, what looks bad and everybody talks about how bad it is, but I got it taste it 
I got to do it. I got to go. God is holding back on me. God just doesn't want me to, to have all of the glorious experiences of the world. You know, it drives me nuts when I hear people that have just enough biblical knowledge that you could put in a thimble and they want to act like they're Bible scholars. Well, I just don't think you have to go to church. Well, I, I, nobody said you had to go to church. I don't know about you folks. I go to church because I want to. I come to worship here because I want to. I come to fellowship with you because I want to. Nobody's twisting my arm up behind my back. Nobody's pulling my hair and making me come to the house of God. I come here because I want to. And if you've lost your want to, then you already got a problem, and you need to be asking God to give you your want to back because I cannot change the scriptures that says forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. And... As the manner of some is. See, even in Paul's day, they were already backing off from the church. And he said, no, no, that's not right. We need to gather together and so much the more as we see the day approaching. And listen, you, you're not blind. You see the signs of the times. You see what's around us. You see what's going on in this world. And you know that the Lord is going to return. So why am I acting like he's not? Why am I living like this life is all that matters? Why am I caught up in the things that I should be staying away from? Because I think God's holding something back on me? God just wants to, wants to restrict me? You should have been here Wednesday night when we talked about the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments aren't restrictions. It's freedom. It's taking a free people and showing you how to stay free. This wild, unrestrained, listen, that's exactly what wasted his life on riotous living. That word riotous means wild, unrestrained, out of control. Isn't that what is lurking down inside of us that wants to be turned loose? I just want to be wild. I don't want nobody telling me what to do. I want to be unrestricted. No laws, no, no limits, no nothing. I just want to do what I want to do. It doesn't work that way, folks. How did that work out for Adam and Eve? Did God cheat them? Oh, this is the best fruit I've ever had. All these other fruits were so bad. This one is so sweet. I didn't, God just cheated me. No, the minute their eyes were open, they recognized that they were naked. They heard God's voice and calling in the cool of the day, and they went and hid themselves from the presence of the Lord. They didn't find freedom. They didn't find fulfillment. They didn't find satisfaction. They found a bondage of sin, and they hid themselves from the Lord. And when the Lord said, Adam, where art thou? He wasn't looking because he didn't know where Adam was. Adam needed to know where Adam was. I heard your voice calling in the, in, in the garden, and I hid myself because I was naked. Uh-oh. Who told you you were naked? Well, that woman you gave me, I think you should just make another woman. She messed me up. Woman, what have you done? Uh, 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 the devil made me do it, <laughs> right? Listen, punishment fell because sin, there's a consequence for it. They weren't prepared for that consequence, were they? They got kicked out of the garden that God had prepared for them. Now he'll toil the ground. Now he'll till the ground. It'll bring forth thorns and thistles. And that's how you'll get your food. And now that's how you'll eat. I won't be providing everything for you. And you don't do anything. You will now work for a living. And Eve, you will now have pain in childbearing. And you'll be given to your husband. And you'll do what he says. Since you couldn't do what you should do, I'm telling you, this is the setup. It has nothing to do with equal rights.
This young couple got married. They were so in love. And uh, he come home from work one day. No supper on the table. He says, honey, no supper on the table? No supper? She says, well, you know what? I went down to an ERA meeting, and they told me that if I didn't want to fix supper for you, I didn't have to. He goes, uh, all right. So he went to the fridge, fixed him a bologna sandwich and Pepsi. So the next morning he gets up and he went to the closet to get him a clean shirt to put on, and there's no clean shirts. And he said, honey, uh, you didn't do the laundry? She said, they told me at that meeting that if I didn't want to do your laundry, I didn't have to do your laundry. He said, all right. Well, Sunday afternoon, he's laying on the couch watching his favorite football team. And boy, it's down to the last seconds of the game. And the quarterback drops back, and they're down by, by three points. And he throws the bomb, and the guy, it just about hits the guy's hand. And she walks by and shuts the television off. And he jumped up and said, woman, what are you doing? She said, they told me at that ERA meeting, if I didn't want to watch football, I didn't have to watch football. He said, how would you like not to see me for about two weeks? She said, I'd like that just fine. Well, two weeks later, she could open one eye and see him just about this much. I'm not advocating punching it out. I'm just... Listen, this, this, is, this is what we think. This is what we think that it's all about equal rights. It isn't about equal rights, folks. It's about God's punishment for sin and the consequences of your sin. Eve is to be uh, under her husband because of the consequences of, of her sin. He used to go till the ground because of the consequences of his sin. The serpent is going to crawl and eat dust the rest of the days of his life. And her seed, by the way, that's a prophecy of the Lord Jesus Christ because she doesn't have seed. The man does. But her seed is going to come and bruise his head as he bruises his heel on the cross of Calvary. But he bruised his head with the resurrection of the dead. Amen. Listen, all of these are punishment from your sin and now you and i are born into sin and we somehow think that we can go do what we want we can live the way we want we can act the way we want we can give ourselves over to our own flesh and not have any consequences and guess what they found out god wasn't cheating them after all he was protecting them How about King David? Listen, he was a bear killer, he was a lion killer, and a giant killer, and a man after God's own heart. But when he got his eyes off of God and on his own fleshly desires, he became an adulterer, he became a liar, he became a deceiver, and he became a murderer. All because he took his eyes off of God and put them on his flesh, and what he wanted was more important than a relationship with God Almighty. And that didn't play out too well for him either, did it? Listen, the enemy wants you to go as far away from God as possible. Live on your own. Do your own thing. Go out and get all the gusto you can get. There's so much in this world to live for. And God and the church is just trying to cheat you. Instead of understanding and realizing God is trying to protect us. What have you let come between you and God? Look at verse 17 of Luke 15. And when he came to himself, he said, how many of my how many hired servants of my father's have bread enough to spare and I perish with hunger? When he came to himself, how long are you going to allow sin 
and the flesh and the world lie to you, deceive you, pull you away from the things that are right and good. How long before you come to your senses? Listen, this world's crazy. It's crazy what the world is trying to accomplish, and I'll tell you what, it's even crazier what the church is allowing to come in and take part in the house of God under the skies of worship. We're worshiping the creature rather than the creator. And listen, if you can't see it, you best start looking around because that's exactly what's going on in the church. How long am I going to go with my senses dulled? When am I going to come to my senses and realize there's got to be something better than this? And when you come to your senses... Look what happens. When you come to your senses, here's what happens. Verse 18. I will arise and go to my father and I will say unto my father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. When you come to your senses and you realize you've gotten off the track and you've let the world take over, you've let the flesh take over, you've let yourself take over, you've let your mind wander into things it shouldn't, you let yourself go into things that it shouldn't, you've left things in your life that needs to be taken care of, left it undone and wide open for the enemy. But when you come to your senses, the first thing the prodigal did was repent. What do I do when I found myself out in this place? You repent. I have sinned before God and before heaven. I am no more worthy to be called his son. You know what that is? That is a humble brokenness and a deep sense of unworthiness before God listen the prodigal son had all the answers nobody could tell him what to do what he was going to do let me ask you how spiritual are you let me ask you how spiritual are you listen I didn't say how much spiritual talk can you do stay with me now Talk is cheap. Doesn't cost you a dime to say it. I didn't ask how much, how spiritually can you talk? How much scripture do you have put into memory? No, let me ask it this way How are you living spiritually? I'm as good as the next Christian. Wrong answer. That just told exactly where you are spiritually. Wrong answer. I fall short of the glory of God. I can find somebody that I might be a little more up the spiritual ladder than, and I might be able to look at that person and say, I have a little more knowledge than you. I do a little more things than you do, and I can look at that, and I can start feeling pretty good about myself. The problem is I'm using the wrong measuring stick. I need to quit measuring myself next to Trish and start measuring myself up to the Lord Jesus. Then I'll realize that I have failed him and ask God, what should I do next? I need to find myself humbled before God and unworthy to be called his son. Instead of holding out my spiritual chest and acting like I'm some high, mighty, spiritual person that God should be so proud of me. God doesn't want to know. He doesn't want to hear you talk about how good you are. He wants you to talk about how good he is. That's why messages in the songs, Amelia, and that's why messages in the songs that we sing has a message. 
Not, not, I, I, we're not singing to somebody that looks at us and says, Ooh, what a glorious voice you have, Amelia. And I just love when you sing. It just gives me goosies. Well, it might if it's of the Spirit. Amen? She should be Spirit-led. When she gets up here to sing or when everybody gets up here to sing, listen, it's about the message of the song and what place it gives God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Not me. He's still working on me. Who is? He is. Yeah. What's some of the words of that song? You, know, you, you got them right there? Can I see it? There really ought to be a sign upon my heart. Don't judge me yet. There's an unfinished part. Listen, people can look at me and see my faults and my failures and who I am and what I am, and they can judge me accordingly. But don't do that. I'm still a work in progress. Amen? But I'll be perfect just according to his plan, fashioned by the master's loving hand. I'm not fashioned by the world. I'm not flesh, fashioned by my flesh, my own personal desires. I'm fashioned by the spirit of God that lives in me and wants to mold me and shape me into the image of God's dear son. And when that's done and when that's being done by the master, it's something special. In the mirror of his word, reflections that I see. You know why most people don't want to read the word of God? Because it reflects them to them, and they don't like what they see. Well, let me tell you something. God don't like what he sees either. That's why he reflects it to you, so that you can see what needs to be changed, what needs to be fixed, what needs to be altered, what needs to be better. Make me wonder why he never gave up on me. When it mirrors who I am, just an old rotten sinner, why did the Lord just not just give up on me? But he loves me as I am. And he helps me when I pray. Remember, <laughs> he's the potter. I'm the clay. What a great song, right? A great song with a great message. That's what it's about. And so I, can, I need to come down off of my spiritual high horse and quit thinking that I'm better than anybody else because my knowledge. Oh, I know all the scripture. Oh, I know what the scripture says about this. And I know what the scripture says about that. Listen. The Lord has opened my eyes to a lot of things in the last 40 years. But not nearly enough. Not nearly enough. I still feel so ignorant when it comes to the word of God. And yet we want to act like we know everything. You know, I mentioned earlier that, that you could take what a lot of people have, have stored up spiritually and put it in a thimble because it doesn't amount to much. I don't think you've got to go to church. Or, uh, I don't think you've got to pray every day. I don't think you've got to. Uh, uh, it doesn't matter what you think. See, that's the problem. Get you out of the way where you can see something. You can hear something. You can feel something. Listen, people say, well, it's not about feeling. No, it's not. But I'm going to tell you something. When you're right with God, it's a pretty good feeling. Amen? I'm going to give you a dime for something you can't feel. When I asked Jesus to take away my sins and wash me clean, when he did that, guess what? I felt pretty good. But a lot of times in my life, he's done things that made me feel pretty good and glad that I'm a child of God. But I'm glad that God never changes. The prodigal changed. He was coming home, not the same boy he left. Oh, he saw it all, and he did it all, and it was all taken away, and he found himself at the lowest part of his life, and he repented and said, I'm going to go home, I'm going to tell the Father I'm not worthy. And I'm sorry. Just make me a hired servant. I'm not even worthy to be a son. But you see, God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. His love for the prodigal didn't change because the prodigal changed. Listen, everyone who rejects Christ and dies and goes to hell, they do it stepping over God's love for them.
the prodigal came home a different person. While he was a great way off, the father saw him. The minute you climb off of the spiritual high horse and come down to earth and remember who you are without God, a sinner. He's watching and he's waiting. And he saw him a great way off. So what did he do? Sit there and go, I knew it would happen sooner or later. He'd spend it all, waste it all. Sooner or later, he'd come back and say, hey, Dad, I need more, right? Get back to the Father's house. No, no, that, the Father wasn't thinking that at all. Because when he saw him afar off, he ran to him. I don't care how far you've gone, and I don't care what you've gotten into, and I don't care where you are today or where you've ever been. The minute you turn to the Father, He will run to you. He didn't only run to Him, He fell on His neck and He kissed Him. And then He said, go put a new robe on Him, put some new shoes on His feet, put a ring on His finger, because this my son was dead, but He's alive again. He was lost, but now He's found. And the Bible tells us there's rejoicing in the presence of angels over one sinner who gives their life to Jesus Christ. Jesus telling the story did not have to give all of these details about the Father. He simply could have said, he ran home to the Father and said, Father, I've sinned. And the Father says, that's all right, I accept it, you're forgiven, come on into the family. That's not what he said. He gave some pretty explicit details about the Father's love for us. He wanted you to know how God feels about you. He wanted you to know what it feels like when a person comes and repents. He wants you to know how God loves you and he's waiting for you and watching for you and he can't wait till you decide to get back in the fold and do the right thing. He'll come to you. He'll hold you. He'll bless you. All the things that the devil and the world and the enemy tells you will not happen will happen because the devil is a liar and God is truth. The rich man in Luke 12 Had more goods than he had barns. Instead of helping somebody, sharing that with somebody, recognizing the blessings that God had given him in his life, it was all about him. So he tore down his barns and built greater barns, and he said, I'll store all my goods in here. Now I've got much goods laid up for many years. I'll eat, drink, and be merry. And God said, you... My friend are a fool because tonight you are going to die. And all of those things that you have put up in those barns, who's going to get those then? Because you won't be taking it with you. You came into the world with nothing, and you'll leave with nothing. Solomon said, let me tell you what life is like. All of the material things that you can have in life is vanity. All the money that you could accumulate, yep, Powerball's at 900 million this morning. When Carol hits it, I'll share it with you. You know how many people think? That's the answer to all their life's problems. 
Let me hit the 900 million. You know how many people have husbands and wives that are lost, children that are lost, neighbors that are lost, that are on their knees today saying, God, help me hit the lottery. You don't think we're in trouble? We're in deep, deep trouble. Solomon said, I've had it all. I've had all the women. I can stand at a thousand. I had all the, all the it's vanity. I lived in the palace. I had great things built, great things done. I have people come from all over the world to bring things, to build things. I've got pools. I've got, I've got lakes. I've got musicians. I've got anything you could think of. I've tried it all, and it's all nothing more than vanity. Because listen to the conclusion of the matter. Ecclesiastes 12. Fear God. Keep his commandments. Because this is the whole duty of man. It's not in the abundance of the things in which you can possess. Those are vanity. Vanity, vanity, vexation of spirit. All that's going to matter when you leave this world is your relationship with Jesus Christ. Nothing else is going to matter. You know, I was just thinking about, you know, Evelyn. Uh, Evelyn Dodge uh, passed away this last week. And uh, I was just thinking about, because her daughter told me that they had to sell the house to keep her in the nursing facility. And I was just thinking, you know, isn't that something? You know, you, you work all your life, for something like a home that her and her husband built that home there and lived there for 69 years, longer than I even been born. Uh, and they established this place and they had it paid for and, they, and all this stuff. And then just to come to the end and you have to sell it and give it to someone who did not labor for it, who did not sweat for it, who did not toil, who didn't raise their family in that home, who didn't reach out to their neighbors in that neighborhood. And we heard several of their neighbors there talking uh, at the funeral. But you know what? If you could see Evelyn today, she would say, you know what? Solomon's right. That's all vanity. You know, you might sit and say, man, that just don't seem fair, does it? And it's not, but look, life's not fair. And this world's not fair, but we're going to a place where the righteous judge lives. And he will judge righteously, and things will be right. But it's not here, it's there. And this is all going to be left behind, and this, my friend, is all vanity. And the only thing that mattered, and the only thing that mattered to Evelyn Dodge was her relationship with Jesus Christ. When you cross from this life to the next, that will be all that will matter to you. So, if it's all that matters... How am I preparing for that crossing? Anybody see the sun this morning in the clouds? Anybody pay attention to it? Through the built-in visor on your windshield, I could look at the sun, and it was red. I turned to Carol, and I said, Hey, when the sun darkens, Maybe this is it. And we were sitting there in a car, and I went, boom, we're gone. <laughs> she almost went anyway. <laughs> and I said, we'd be gone, and this car would just be veering off the road into that house over there. Hope they're all saved, because they'll be gone too, and the car just come to a rest. If not, may run over somebody in there, and they'll not get another chance. But listen, folks, that's how quick it's going to happen. And all that you are preparing to hold on to will be gone. And it won't mean anything up there. It won't mean anything in the, in the new heaven and the new earth. It won't mean anything in the new Jerusalem. All that's going to matter is your relationship with the Lord Jesus.
Haven't we just allowed the enemy to just a rough shot a little too long? I don't know about you, but I've never been the kind of guy that likes to be pushed around. Now, I'll, tell you, I'll take some pushing around, but I don't like to be pushed around. Do you? Do you like somebody to push you around? You like somebody to say things to you that don't set well and they know it? How do you take that? Listen, the enemy do whatever he can to get you to crumble and fall. So he's going to rough shot. Listen, let me ask you today, your life in shambles? Maybe you look right on the outside and maybe everything you, you try to make everybody feel like it's all rosy on the outside, but maybe on the inside you're in shambles. Listen, I don't, I, you the only one knows that. Is your life out of control? Isn't it time you just come to your senses? Because God's waiting for you. Did you come here today to lie to yourself one more time? Oh, he's not talking to me. I'm glad. Pass it on back. He ain't talking to me. I'm right. I know where I'm going. I know I'm right with God, and uh, I'm on my spiritual high horse. Listen, folks. Please come down from there because God wants to do so much for you. Isn't it time we just come to our senses? Because when we do, we'll find God waiting, and he's been waiting. Don't fool yourself another moment. Let's stand together. To those watching by Facebook, we're going to say goodbye to you this morning. But let me say this to you. Step up here where they can see me. Let me just say, it doesn't matter whether I'm sitting in your living room or in your kitchen or wherever you are watching this broadcast. Let me just say to you that God is there. And you don't have to be in this church to get on your knees and come to your senses and get it right with God today. Would you do that? I'm encouraging you to do that. And if you do, please drop us a note and tell us what you, you've done, what the Lord's done in your life, what the Lord's doing in your life. We want to know. And we'll pray with you and we'll, and we'll, we'll, we'll hold you up in prayer. Lord willing, we'll see you on Wednesday night. For the rest of us here.